Hello, and welcome to Local Legacies, the show where we go behind the scenes with enterprising individuals who are striving for the best in their business, family, community, and themselves. I'm your host, Tim Lanza, and without further ado, here's this week's guest. All right, in the studio today, we've got Kenny Ricker. Um, very excited to have you joining me today. From the beginning of coming up with this concept, you were somebody I was looking forward to speaking with. Currently, you are the owner of On the Rocks, a bar in Lunenburg, and um, you're the dean of students at Samoset Middle School. So you've got a wide array of things you're involved with, um, and you fit pretty well into our demographic of people we've been speaking with, so I'm happy to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm actually very honored that uh, I was thought of for your podcast. I think this is a great idea and a fun concept. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, so why don't I have you start at the beginning, wherever you want to start from, as far as your educational background or your background in education, rather, uh, and we'll go from there. Sure. Um, I'm an 88 graduate of Lemister High School. Uh, throughout Lemister, I, the, my years there, I uh, took business classes in what they called DECA back then, which was Distributive Education Clubs of America. Um, I was the president of the club for all four years in high school. I was really into business my whole life because my father was into business. But when I got out of high school, I uh, decided to go the education route. I uh, graduated Fitchburg State, went to UMass for a while, then graduated Fitchburg State, and uh, got my degree in psychology and education. And then I pursued my degree in master program to get into school guidance. Worked at Johnny Appleseed School for about five years. Um, and realized that I needed more. Um, I wouldn't say I'm financially driven, but um, I'm driven to be a provider for my family. So I wasn't making ends meet teaching, so I start, I was bartending a lot too. And in about 2004, I bought some property on Whalem Lakefront and um, I wanted to open a sports bar. That's when I uh, came into on the rocks and left my teaching job for that and started going from there and from there I built the other businesses as well. Okay so um, when how did exactly did on the rocks come to be what did that look like for you? Yep it was a uh, it was a tough one I, I was about 33 at the time um, I went to about five banks in the area for a loan uh, I got denied by all of them I ended up going through a private uh, loan firm um, and got a really high interest rate and I was able to secure the money to buy the property and open the business as well and then after about four years being in business I was able to create kind of a track record with the bank so then uh, I got involved with the banking systems and and started getting money from there paid off my loans and so forth and then got legit so to speak and started getting my loans through banks because I had a history but it was, a, it was, you know, looking back at it now at 51 years old, it was a really steep uh, move to make for me at 34 with uh, my second child on the way. Um, it, was a, it was a real brazen move, but uh, I didn't realize it then as much. Uh, I put up my house. I, I, I did a lot to, to acquire on the rocks. But uh, once it started and started to flow, things get easier, and, and you build confidence, which I think is the most important thing in business. And um, from there on, I always had a plan to open. I wanted three places in 10 years, so um, that's when everything started to evolve. And like I said, I got familiar with the bank, so getting money wasn't as hard. That obviously makes a big difference as far as uh, opening up funding and being able to move at a faster rate of speed. Oh, absolutely. Um, it was actually the second one I still had to get private funding because it was a big leap. It was someone else's building when I opened the luxury box, and it was quite a bit of money to invest because it was a shell. But um, again, same thing. Once I got in and had a track record of about a year, the bank took me over. I was able to pay off that debt uh, with a high interest rate. Like ten, We're talking 10%. We're talking a, you know pretty big interest rates back then. And um, by the third one, then I started having capital to to build my own, you know, things when I opened Embers about uh, 10 years later. Um, I was kind of on my own by that point, so I had my own capital, was able to do things, so it made it fun. Yeah. Now, going into On the Rocks, did you have, I know you said you wanted to open a sports bar. 
did you have a vision for what that was going to look like? I mean, if you go, anyone who's been there recently, you know, the location is gorgeous, but it wasn't at all what it is today when you started. Absolutely. Um, it was what they call a rose between two thorns. At the time, there was two kind of biker bars down there, and it was a, it was a rough spot. Whalem was decaying more and more every day. Uh, it had been closed since 2000, so the area was really dilapidated and, and, and just really going to hell. And um, I remember bringing my parents up there when I actually purchased the property, and I was they were in the back seat of my car. My, my, my mother was in the front, and um, my dad was in the back. And I drove by and stopped, and I said, um, I just bought this property. I'm going to open a sports bar. And my mother started to cry, and my father got, like, a little angry. He's like, what are you doing? You have two children on the way, a house, and a good job. And I said, no, this is something I need to do. I want to try it. And um, I never really was nervous until the day I w went in, and they had sheetrocked the whole place after I rebuilt it, and it looked so small. And I said to myself, oh, my God, I think I might have screwed up. But, uh, you know. 17, 18 years later, the place is still thriving and and doing really well. So I think it was a good decision. But like I said, it was a it was a tough decision. It you know back then it didn't seem tough, but when I look at what I did financially, it was a crazy decision. I would never do that again at fifty one, but it ended up working. So now, do you think you, know, you hear people say a lot when you're young, that's the time to take risk, but not so much that you weren't young in age, but you know you had a wife, you had a couple kids it you know do you think that was the best time for you to make that move or it, you just look back and it is what it is you know it is what it is the only thing I had going for me throughout everything is my wife has always been super supportive um when I have an idea she's one of those people that you know she, she believes in me so it works so uh all three ideas you know sometimes I tell her a little late uh, I don't tell her when I should they're in, you know, they're rolling in the in the making for a while, but she's always been very supportive, so it made it easy. But I'll tell you, confidence is is more than half the battle, though. Going into it, knowing what you want to do, having a vision, and really believing you can achieve it. And I have this one thing about me is I can see things before I build them without plans. I've never had plans for anything I've ever built, any restaurant or bar. Um, I draw them on a napkin with the guy that builds for me, and we go from there. But I can visualize it for some reason, and, and it usually comes out spot on. So I'm fortunate in that respect. A lot of people can't do that. Where do you think this confidence comes from? You know, did you have it at a young age, or is it something you were able to build over time? You know, I really don't know. It's a great question because um, when I look back at things, um, I'm not a super confident person in everyday life. It's just when it comes to business platforms, I always, the visual aspect of it, it's a no fail to me. It's a, it has to work. I have to make it work. And uh, for some reason that is, you know, to this day, knock on wood has proven me right. And, and things have, um, you know, been pretty successful in, the, in that sense. I think there's like a certain set of rules to business or I almost look at it like a game and you can move your pieces in certain places and do certain things. And as long as you stay within the rules of success, you can find success wherever you go. It just takes an enormous amount of work. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Uh, very much so. And, um, you know, you have to remember one thing uh, when you in, in my opinion, when you open a business, it has to remain a business. Always. You have to treat it like you did when you opened it. Because if you get away from that, I've seen it happen to a lot of people, you lose the integrity piece to it. And people really need to see that it's a solid business and always evolving. And it can't go backwards. And, and you can't, the expression, shit where you eat, you know what I mean? Like you, you really have to focus on your business, running it properly, and having a lot of integrity in that business. So people look at you that way in your business. So they, they want to come back in. They don't want it to be a joke or a shit show. They, they want it to be a functioning business where they can go and have a good time and, and feel respected and safe. Well, and uh, you know, I've worked in the restaurant industry for over 10 years. Obviously, you've got well over that. And I, I think that's where one of the places you see it the most of people blurring that lines or just largely crossing over the line is you know, you're drinking at your own bar and you're, you're buy, quote unquote, buying people drinks, you're giving away drinks, 
you know, you're taking away that revenue from the business and it's not operating and standing on its own. Yeah, very true. You know, that's that's the one thing I really held uh, in high regard is exactly that. I mean, I'll, you know, I'll go in some nights and buy some some really good regulars, a few cocktails here and there, you know, go talk to a lot of people in some tables and I'll, I'll have a drink. A lot of times, if you come in my establishment, you'll see me with a drink in my hand, but it might be the same one I've had for three hours. I just walk around with it because, uh, you know, people always, they're generous and they want to buy you a drink. They like your establishment and I allow it. I'll let them buy me a drink and I'll get to it eventually, but it's... Um, it's just been one of those things that I feel is really important is just keeping the integrity there for your business and, and that level of trust with people so they know that you know, you're know you an upstanding person. Yeah, you had made a comment to me in a previous conversation that you know your name is everything, not yours in particular, but whoever you are as a person, your name is everything. So can you elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah, my philosophy is that's your one given thing. I mean, that's your name and I feel, it, you know, you constantly need to have integrity with it and treat people with respect. And I have children now, three of them, and um, I love when they go places and they come home and they say, oh, I met so-and-so and he had so many nice things to say about you and mom. Or, you know, that's that's what I live for. I mean, that's, that's everything I want in life. You don't know how long you're gonna be here. And uh, when I hear, you know, when people hear the name Ken Ricker, I want them to know, you know, he's a good guy. You know, he's a respectful guy. He treats people fair. and. That's how life should be. And I think uh, life has gotten away from that in a lot of ways. But I think if you really care about yourself and your family and, you know, your heritage, I think it's it's a really Im important attribute to have as a person. I think especially when you're in, you know, a involved in a small business, in a community, that really lingers a lot more than if, you know, if you're moving around from place to place or whatever, you know, people know who you are and they're going to go support your business or support whatever you're doing because of that reputation that you carry with you. Exactly. That's, that's exactly how I feel. And, um, it's so important and, you know, and, and giving back to your community, um, where it all started. I've, I've done some nice fundraisers for the town of Lunenburg. We've done some nice things in Lemonster and you want to give back and you want to give back to the the, you know, the students of, of Lemonster and Lunenburg, and we do a lot of things to give back because I'm appreciative of what I've gotten from the community. And speaking of the students, you know, let's talk a little bit more, I guess, about where your path led as far as your educational career. Yeah, you know, I always loved, um, I, I feel like I have a knack, I have a, a, a real good relationship with the students, and I um, I've been there, you know, I had a lot of fun in high school. I, I was a, an average student, you know, and um, I can relate to the kids and in, in the different areas they're in. And I always wanted to go back, but like I said, financially, it just wasn't there for me. It's a great career if you put your time in and you get to the end, you know, it's a, it's a lot of fun and you can make some good money and have a nice retirement. I wasn't patient enough. And uh, like I said, with a the family, there was, I had wants and, uh, needs that I, I couldn't do with my salary. So leaving and then when I opened um, Embers, um, at the time I opened On the Rocks and Embers, and then there was another place called Captain's Lounge that had closed and I really wanted it to open a breakfast place so I ended up buying it. So I owned all three on the strip at the time in Whalum. And right when I did, um, I had gotten a call from one of the principals at Samoset that they were looking for a dean of students would I have any interest? And I had been out 17 years, I think. And I actually thought about it with the high insurance rates I was paying and everything else. I'm like, you know what, I love it. I'm financially stable now where I could do what I really love and afford it. So I interviewed, um, I actually took a, what they call a tutor job for the school for three months and just to get the swing of things again and get back in it. and. Uh, it was really low paying and it was fun. It was kind of a wake up call for me to get in it, but I think it helped me in the long run. I interviewed with, I think against 42 people total and ended up getting the job and um, best decision I made. Uh, I had a lot of fun with it and I'm still having fun with it. I've gotten laid off a few times due to the layoffs in the city, but it's something I really enjoy. And I want to throw in there too, for people that maybe just work like a normal job, their company pays their insurance. You know, you mentioned the insurance that you're paying it to just, really quickly touch on that and explain what that looks like when you own your own business. Yeah, you know, at my, at my highest, right, when I when I left, my, my wife had gone in, like, literally months before me. She's an occupational therapist, and she hadn't worked throughout our marriage. Uh, we were fortunate enough she didn't have to. She took care of the kids and did all that, but she went back first and actually got the benefits, 
and at the time, I'll never forget it, she came home, she interviewed, she got the job, and uh, she said, I don't even know what I'm making, and I said, I don't even care. I said, you're getting benefits. I said, you're going to save me at the time $2,011 a month, and that, that was huge. You know what I mean? Like, I didn't even care about a salary. It was just the benefits. It's, you know, we had months where you know, in business, you don't make it and you're going to make cuts, but I could never cut health insurance because I have three kids and a family. So and you're talking about more than a mortgage. Oh my God. It was always more than my mortgage and I couldn't believe it. And then, um, when she got the job, it's just the amount of stress that was off my shoulders was amazing. And then when I started working and then all of a sudden I'm getting another paycheck and she was, it was like, this is fun now, you know, now we're enjoying what we're doing and we're able to live on it now where we wouldn't, have been able to before and um yeah it's worked out well now working as the dean and obviously that takes up a good chunk of time how does that how do you make that work balancing the business well to be honest with you it's a priority because it's such a important uh job um i deal with all the problems in schools either with families and discipline or court system or you know children have problem on the weekends or their parents do or anything i mean i'm always that's my priority. I mean, I run my business now, but I'm able to run it in a different way. I have a business partner, so uh, I'm able to put a lot on him if I have to. But, you know, school's the priority, and it's it's fun. I really enjoy it, but, you know, it's a good balance. I've always been able to balance. I can do that, you know, pretty well. As the dean, what's your day-to-day -day like? And I'm sure it varies, but what, what are the types of things you're dealing with normally? Oh, yeah. I, I do. Um, any parent that comes in the building at all for any reason comes through me first. Uh, we start there. Um, if parents are having conferences with students that uh, might not be working to their potential, I'll sit in on those. I do all attendance. I do all discipline. So any court-related issues, I have to do those. If there's any issues with families in court, I have to be involved. Um, it's kind of you're taking all the pressure off the principal and the vice principal and letting them do the curriculum piece and running the building and while I take all the, the hits on everything else as far as um, like I said, attendance and, and working with families and if other problems and field trips and overseeing things like that. So I, I, I'm kind of seeing a parallel here with the ownership of a business is like you're just constantly putting out fires. Yeah, really. That's really what it is. And as a dean, that's kind of what you're really doing. You're constantly trying to help the students better their lives. But when they hit obstacles that they can't get out of, you got to dive in and help them out of it and, and with their families. Now, you're go just, I know we're kind of jumping around a little bit here, but going back to On the Rocks, so how long were you open? Have you been running the business before you decide to dive in again with the next venture, which it was, it was Luxury it, Box? Yeah, it was five years um, for both. Uh, I, was, I opened in um, 04 at On the Rocks. I opened Luxury Box in 09, and I opened uh, Embers in 13. So I just kept doing them in um, five-year increments, and, which was my plan. I wanted to open three and ten. And uh, I had uh, my uncle, John Feeney, was his name, Johnny Feeney. They, they used to own um, Feeney Shoe Store, him and my Uncle Benny. And my Uncle Johnny, he just passed away, him and his wife, four days apart uh, last year. And uh, he was a, a frequent flyer at Luxury Box with my um, with his daughter, Dee Dee, and, and his and grandson, Adam. And they used to come in all the time. And um, when I was, he loved the luxury box. He enjoyed on the rocks too. But when I was opening Embers, uh, he said to me, Kenny, you're going to slow down. You know, now he's 90 something years old. And I, and I know everything he's saying. He's been through it all. And he's like, you're going to get too big. It's going to get, you know, ahead of you. And you're not going to be able to. And he was exactly right. That's what happened. I opened the third. I'm not a manager person. I never have been. I didn't have managers at my restaurants. I kind of ran the show and I, I had lead people and people that helped and but um i had my hand on everything and it did it got overwhelming he was right but uh every five years i opened one until the third one and then i realized that was enough now all right i guess did you listen to his advice or did his advice just happen to be right because i think or i shouldn't say i think i just from my own experience but you probably experienced i would assume in your life on the way of building up lots of other people saying that you know, once you open the first one, or before you open the first one, it's like, hey, do you really want to do this? You think, you know, you said your, your mom was crying. Your oh, dad yeah. was, you know, had some disdain. Yep. Do you really want to do this? You've got a family. You should be thinking about that. And then all along the way, you've got these people that are, 
you know, you're talking about your confidence pushing you forward, and I'm sure you've got people in your life of varying levels of closeness kind of trying to pull you back a little bit. Yeah, th there's truth to that. Um, but no, I, I, I really did. He was right. He was 100% right. I, I would have probably opened more, honestly, but it was the, the time in life in the world where the changes were happening, where the workforce was being depleted, people weren't working as hard, you know, people weren't taking jobs as serious anymore. And I was seeing that in the employee aspect. I had great employees in all my places. I mean, some of the ones that are on the rock 17 years later are still there 17 years later. And um, I loved all of them, but it was tougher and tougher to get employees to cover shifts and get people to work. And the stress of that is what kind of put me over the edge where I said, you know what, you know, what really am I doing this for? If, if, if everyone worked as hard as they did in 2004, when I was opening on the rocks and I think I probably would have stayed in it, but the world has just changed so much where, you know, people all have second jobs, you know, waitressing or bartending isn't your priority anymore. Where back in the day it was, people were professional waitresses and bartenders and they did really well, but people got away from that. And I think trying to keep them employed was so tough because it, they only worked one or two shifts a week. So it, it, it got me away from it a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I'm in that exact same boat right now. It's like I've worked two, three shifts serving, and it's like, hey, can you pick up another shift? It's like I'm working 60, 70 hours in my main job trying to keep that going, and this is in addition on the side, and I'm trying to help out as much as you can, but you're getting pulled, and now obviously – within the last year and a half, I think there's even less people that are motivated to work. Everyone's either, you either have no job or three. It's so true, it's just the way it is. And, and the way it has been the last couple of years now with with unemployment and you know the people collecting and the extra stimulus and everything else, it's, it's making it even more difficult. And um, I'm glad I'm out of it at this point. Like I I have my one spot now that I'm really enjoying in, in the, the building downtown, but um, it, I'm, I'm on the right path, I think. I'm a lot less stressed. Yeah, and something you know, I'd love to bring up, and I think this is a perfect time to segue into talking a little bit about your family and their involvement with the businesses, but tell, if you would, for the, on the mic, the story about you going to work in the morning when you had opened the breakfast place. Yeah, I opened uh, Breakfast at Embers. Um, we opened in December. Um, uh, forgive me on that one. I, I want to say it was like December of maybe... 18 or 19 and um we wanted to do breakfast on weekends because i really wanted to put a breakfast place on the lakefront but i couldn't get that captain's building in time um they wouldn't sell at the time so i decided to do it at embers and um we did it and it was flying and my guy was awesome he was uh, a breakfast cook on a cruise ship so he had some great ideas and the food was tremendous we were serving unlimited bloody marys and stuff and it was so fun um but I was working like crazy, and I was going in at 6 in the morning and on the weekends. You know, this is after working full week and school and everything else. And then one morning, I, I get up, and I went in my son's room and to give him a kiss to say goodbye. And he said, you know, Dad, where are you going? And I said, I got to work again. But he's like, Dad, you're working too much. This is ridiculous. You know, you know, in, in his little way of saying it. And it really made me think. Like, he's like, I want to do something. I want to play basketball. I want to do this. And I was like, you know what? I went to work that day, and... We worked, and I told uh, my breakfast guy, I just said, we're done. I said, we're going to end at the end of December. At the time, I, I think it was the beginning of December, I said, we're going to pull the plug. I'm not going to do breakfast. And he's like, what are you talking about? It's just starting to you know, take off. It's going really well. I'm like, you know what? It's just I'm not there anymore. I'm too much involved, and I'm not home enough, and that's never where I wanted to be. And my, at the time, nine-year-old son made that decision for me and made it really clear. And it wasn't him, he didn't beg for it, he just said it the way it was and it made me really realize it's not what it's about, you know what I mean? It's just not, I can keep going forever and building and building, but there comes a time for family and this is it. And so you said that's not what it's about, and you know, kind of what is it about for you? Obviously you said family, but what does that look like as far as their involvement, I guess, throughout the time of your building, having the kids, you know, your wife, and then where are things now? To me, it's always just been stability with um, my wife is a tremendous mother. She raised the kids. You know, I was gone a lot. And um, 
it was about fulfilling needs, but n not necessarily all monetary. I wasn't, I wasn't a huge guy into huge money and, and having the best of everything. It was just about being a provider, giving my kids everything that I had and maybe a little more, but you know, at the same time, she was teaching them to be good humans and, and not just, you know, accepting monetary things all the time. And we had a really good balance and that's all I really wanted. I just wanted my family to have a, a good life. You know what I mean? They don't have to have the best life. I just wanted to have a really good life, a good stable life. Now, how do you balance that as far as being able to, as a parent, give your kids things and you probably want them to have a little bit, like you said, better life than what you had, you know, and not go too far? I don't know. You know, I, I guess that's a lot on my wife on how she raised them because they do, you know, like they got new cars when they got their license because I could afford it. And, um, but they've always been extremely appreciative of it and they're good with it and they don't, I don't know why. I mean, I can't, I can't say because you, you see people with children and everyone raises their children differently and you don't really know where they're going to go. But I think her being home with them for the first 12 or whatever, 15 years of marriage really made the difference. You know, we, like I said, we were fortunate enough to do that. And I don't know, they just have a really good appreciation for things. Yeah. Cause I definitely see that, you know, we, my brother and I were raised in such a way that it was like, if you want something, work for it, Yep. you know, go get it. And I'm sure you were raised in a very similar way. So that, uh, drive and that work ethic was like drilled into our heads at a very young age. And I also grew up alongside kids that were given a lot and come to find out 20 years later, you know, that was more of a hindrance than it was a benefit. Like it seemed like it was good in the short term, short term, but in the long run, they didn't learn a lot of the lessons by having to grind it out. True. You know, that is true. And I can see that. Um, my kids have always worked, you know, they had to pay for gas for their cars. They, you know, if they wanted anything outside of the scope of what we were giving, they had to work for it. And they do. You know, my daughter's a junior at Worcester State in the OT program, but she works, you know, she maintains her own bank account. She, she works, she works all summer. She makes money. She works hard. Um, she has a great work ethic, and as does my son, Ross, who's attending UMass this year. And uh, they're just, I don't know. I don't know how to say it. I guess they, it's a, they're a good product of both parents, of both, what we both have kind of instilled in them. They've accepted, and it's been good thus far, you know. Well, having, you know, a strong partner as a wife and being able to set that example of – you know, there's a balance. You're setting an example on one side in the work and what you're doing and building and achieving, and she's kind of teaching them how to be as a human. Well, you're both teaching them how to be yep. as a human in life, but to uh, like a, like a diametric example. Yeah, that's a good point, and it's true. That's just the way it was. That's that's how it was. We were a great team, and we're still a good team. And um, you know, we have one still going into eighth grade this year, my son Ryan, and uh, he's writing. You know, he's he's kind of more like me um he wants to get into the business side he keeps talking about you know going to school for business and and things but he's a worker and does a lot of yard work for me and things and asks for things you know he doesn't expect things and you know he, when he wants something you know we try to provide what we can and but he's always grateful for it yeah how do you feel about that like him or any of your other kids being involved with the business is that something you've encouraged or no, you know, not not particularly on the rocks where it's more of a bar. And um, I don't really want them in that setting as of yet. Alexa's is only 20. Ross is 18. And Ryan's only 13. So um, uh, when I own the luxury box, though, in Embers, yeah, they, they did. They, you know, wash dishes, did, you know, bus boy, bus girl, stuff like that. And uh, Alexa started the bar back and, and do things. But um, they always would dive in if I needed them and called them. They came right out. No hesitation. They never whined about it. This the way it was I'm not you know if they if they want to go in there I won't if they want to go in that arena um I wouldn't discourage them but um I think they're finding their own paths already like I said my my wife's an OT and Alexa wants to be an OT so she's going to Worcester State for that but you know if the businesses are there I mean I seem to be selling them all off but if on the rocks is there when they're older and they want to get involved in it it's provided a great life for me so I would hope it could do the same for them 
Uh, now let's talk a little bit about you know you had a 30-day write-in to run for mayor that was obviously a big deal around here what, where did that come from what did it kind of look like you know talk a little bit about that yeah you know what it is it's um I've always liked Dean Azarella. Uh, I think he's done a fine job um it's just when it comes down to it I'm a business guy when I when I look at the economic development plan of Lemonster and, and what has happened. And at the time I was a Dean of students and we had one of the largest layoffs in the system. Uh, everyone was losing their job. Education never has really been a huge priority in Lemonster. And, um, I just think it was a combination of seeing where Lemonster was going. We were filling up with all the big boxes. We were so commercial and retail strong. And then seven miles up the road, in Devons, they're transforming this old army base into um, these major Pfizer, Budweiser, Coca-Cola, major corporation headquarters going in seven miles up the road. And when you looked at it, like when I looked at it, we have better highway access, you know, which is our really the best part of what Lemister has is our access and, and where we're located geographically. And um, I think the layoffs and everything just pushed it where I was like, you know what, I, I think I could do this. You talk about with the school system. Yeah, with the layoffs in the school system and, and where we were going in the direction of, you know, economic development where I wasn't seeing corporations, we weren't seeing industries. It was all retail focused. And um, I, you know, I just, I had an idea and my wife was okay with it. So I said, you know, I know it's going to be a long shot, but I, I want to throw it out there. He never really has had... Um, I wouldn't say strong competition. That's not the right word, but he's had some competition. But I just felt like I wanted to give it a shot. I, I work hard in Lemonster. I'm a Lemonster guy. I'm, you know, my family's from Lemonster, and I'm kind of going back to your name. You know, I worked hard for my name, and, and I think I've had the respect of people, and I feel like I had a shot. Did I think I would win? I don't know. Um, I guess no one does because it's still under investigation today, four years later. But uh it was a good time. You know, I enjoyed it. It was a little tough, you know. You, you get these computer commando people that hide behind the screen and can say what they want about people when you're running in, in races. And it was tough because I have children and people were saying crazy things about, you know, my business and my character as a person, which didn't have any bearing on anything or any weight to support it. But uh, I don't regret doing it at all. I think it opened his eyes a little bit and showed him that, you know, Let's face it, you know, it can be done. And then, you know, two years later, I wasn't in that spot. I was working. Uh, I had my first child going to college. I had one going to high school. I had one so excited to come to middle school with me finally, where I was the dean. Um, and it wasn't, it was all timing. And um, I really didn't want to run. If I did, I mean, it was kind of in the bag. Let's face it, I, I ran a 30-day campaign and got, you know, 40 nine point four percent of the votes and um but i didn't want it it wasn't you know a priority to me at the time and um is it out of the way forever probably like i don't really i don't see it right now anyway because you know the way i'm doing things and as a dean I'm, I'm very relaxed things are good i have 10 weeks off in the summer and i'm first time in my life i'm enjoying that and we're traveling a lot with the kids and stuff and things are going good now, honestly, that is one of the main reasons I wanted to have you on here and talk to you. And it's, you know, what is interesting to me is, you know, the 30 day campaign and the closeness of the election. I'll ask you, what do you think that says about you as a person, your character and what this, the people in this area think about you? I think um, people were ready for a change. Um, I wouldn't go as far as saying if anyone did it, they would have done that well. Um, I think, you know, uh, the way I am as a person, the way I treat people and the way um, my family is in the community. And, you know, we've all been in Lemister. My brother works for the DPW. My sister has worked um, in Lemister for a long time. Um, you know, my dad was in the restaurant business. My mom worked at the high school. So I think we were, we were, you know, kind of well known as far as the name, people knew us, and um, I think it helped. And uh, I had a good team of people that helped me. 
and I think at the time people were just ready. I think they were, you know, they saw an opportunity where, wow, maybe this can work, you know? Yeah. I think you, you know, just from my perspective, you know, you bring a lot to the table, you know, aside from just the name, but I, I think it does say a lot about you and the way people feel about you, your integrity and, and things of that nature. So I think that that's a very important thing to touch on. Yeah, I, I, th I agree. And um, like I said, from the beginning, I've, I've always been uh, friendly with Dean and we talked quite a bit and I used to text him here and there on different issues or whatever. And we talked and um, I definitely think he cares about this community and I have never know would I say anything about him as far as uh, in a negative way or a negative light because um, you know that's a tough position to hold uh, you have a lot of people against you and um, he's you know he's done some good things for the city and I think people are just really complacent and comfortable but um, I I enjoyed that 30 days um, I think it kind of showed everyone there is someone can make a difference you know what i mean and uh i think we opened some eyes so something that you touched on uh in the beginning of that and something that's been a pretty great interest to me i've talked to a lot of other guests about in the next five or ten years where do you see lemonster going and where do you think we should be going or th think things should be focused on economically and in other areas yeah, uh, that's a great question. Um, personally, uh, I think we need to really focus on our economic development plan. I think we need to bring more industry and businesses to Lemonster and less retail, focus less on the big box and, and less on the, um, the, the giants that are coming in and, and more on industry, kind of try to mirror what Devin's did a little bit and bring corporate America here. Um, but you know, be realistic about it. Um, you know, not bringing an Amazon with 50,000 employees when you have a city with 49,000 or whatever it is, um, in an infrastructure that wouldn't work. Um, but bringing, you know, corporation headquarters and some industries that are, you know, taking kids from trade schools and, and other things and putting them to work. And, um, I would focus on education a little more, spend more, you know, we gotta update what we have. You know, I'm in. I'm in the trenches. I'm in the schools. I see what we have. We put a 42, 40 something, 42 million dollar um, amount of money into Lemister High School, and it's the same Lemister High School as it was in 1980. You know, not much has changed. We need to uh, upgrade our resources and get the trade schools more focused on business, on the business side of things, and more focused on everyday life for the kids to learn. And, and the funding is gonna be there. We need more funding. We need more supplies. You know, our, our supply closets are bare at our schools, and it just shouldn't be that way. Uh, those are the things I see. Um, where it will be, where it's going, I don't know. I think the same as it has for the 28 years. We're going to see our taxes go up. You're going to see our assessments go up. Maybe not our taxes, but the assessment, which in light makes our taxes go up. Um, hopefully we're not uh, going to expedite things to, you know, try to pay off any more things in a, in a rushed manner like they like they did the pension system um, where it took away from the retirees and things I mean hopefully we have a little more focus but I don't know hopefully I'll be here still you know I, I plan on, on, on being around um, I do like the ocean and I like to get closer to it so we'll see now you are someone who you know I think you see a lot of business owners and their business owns them and you seem to be someone who definitely owns your businesses and they work for you what do you think the difference is between those two types of people and how have you been able to make that happen um definitely time allotment and um you know i every business i've opened you know for the first year i pour my heart and soul into it and i'm not around and everyone knows that but uh my focus is to get out of that uh, rut and to let the business run and trust your employees. You know, that's been the major thing for me, having good people. Have I been stung a couple times? I have. But, I mean, really focus on, you know, our relationship with our employees, um, having a nice mutual respect for each other, and treating business like a business. And uh, I don't believe you have to live and die there. I mean, some people do, and it works great. 
Uh, some people don't, and it fails. Um, I've always had a nice balance. Um, I maintain, you know, technology has changed too. There's cameras everywhere. I'm hooked up to my systems. So I do see what's going on, and I'm constantly looking, and my wife will always, you know, we'll be on vacation. She'll be like, stop looking at the cameras or this and that. But, you know, stay involved, but, you know, whatever's important to you, some people might not feel as it's important, you know, family, where family's everything to me. And um, my focus has always been to maintain a strong family bond and never feel like dad's not home. And when Ryan said that to me that day, I can't believe you're going to work on a Saturday and I wanted to play basketball. That made me realize I was starting to get in the trap, so I got right out. Now, speaking of pouring your heart into businesses in the first year of them starting, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about what you've got going on most recently and where that's headed. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Um, sometimes you have visions in life and, and being a bar owner and a restaurant owner and seeing things and learning the systems and dealing with overpouring. I had an audit on the rocks and um, it was huge. It was life changing for me. And it was as having to do with being, you know, having my employees overpour and not paying enough attention to that. So I learned and I always thought about, you know, cocktails and cans like why wouldn't we want metered pours but you don't like when you go to a restaurant and you see them have those measured pours you never feel like you're getting enough and the drinks don't taste normal so let's let's be honest you you always need a little more but you get carried away so i've always had the idea of cocktails in a can measured pours and if they came out and i wanted to do it like six, seven years ago, but you know, the funding and everything doing it. And I wish I did, because if I did, I would have been ahead of the curve and I'd probably, you know, be on Could an be island white somewhere. Claw. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but there comes a time when, you know, I had the vision, had the vision. To be honest, I was, I was more going vodka, but watching the market, seeing where it was, vodka was starting to get saturated. The seltzers overtook everything. But seltzers are seltzers, you know what I mean? You drink them, you, you burp. Women don't like them a lot. You know, you, you get you, you get gassy with them and stuff. But I wanted a craft cocktail. I wanted, like, a cocktail you could get at a bar or restaurant but in a can and still have the flavor, you know, not an overabundance of carbonation and um, really have good taste and, and feel it, you know. You know, be able to drink the drink and, and, and not – get overwhelmed by the booze aspect of it but you know know you're having a cocktail but enjoy it and having it taste good and finally i was able to secure the funding to do that and uh i started sundial cocktails about well actually a year ago august 5th i started everything and i became incorporated and everything and then um found the right person to guide me and help me and um be a liaison and um we're good. We're in full production mode. We're in warehouse mode where we have um, everything is skewed and done and ready to go. We're just in the in the midst of um, getting distributors to take the product on and hopefully go crazy with it. Now, I'm sure people are going to want to know around here when they can start drinking it. So what does that look like? Yeah, I have a pretty big appointment coming up in August with um, a major distributor in the area. Um, and if they take the line, then I'm hoping we start seeing it within 30 to 45 days all throughout, you know, Massachusetts and New England. That's the goal. Well, I think, you know, I see here and basically just a recurring theme in your life. Um, you know, you see something, you have a vision and then you just charge towards it with unbridled confidence. And, you know, I hope you come in here sharing a little bit of your story and some people getting to listen to it. You can kind of be an inspiration for some other people to do the same because, you know, you've only got so much time to do whatever it is you want to do. And it, I think it's a shame to have someone who looks back towards the end of their life and says, you know, I really wanted to do this or I really could have done that. Or if I had just if I had just taken that first step, you know, they could be where you're at right now, which is accomplishing those dreams and, you know, fulfilling those visions. Yeah, I, I agree. And, you know, the, the only advice I can give people is, you know, like I said, this idea was in my mind for five to seven years, but I couldn't secure the funding to do it right. So until you can do it right and your vision can be obtained, um, I don't see a reason. 
I guess I would talk people out of it. You know, if you're not ready, don't do it. When you're ready and everything, the stars are aligned, you, you got to go for it. But uh, don't try to piecemeal it because, they're, you know, it's a major business and you you really have to be laser focused on every aspect and you, and you really can't rely on, you know, a wish or hoping that something's going to happen. You really need to know what's going to happen. Now, how does that compare, like, with the cocktail company to your first business and starting that up? Uh, same way. You know, I, I, I wanted to do On the Rocks, but uh, I, I didn't take that leap until I got funding. I mean, I got rejected by, I think it was six, you know, local banks. And I understood, you know, it's a, you know, it's got one of the highest fail rates in business is the restaurant business. And um, I, I understood what they were doing, but I was getting mad at the same time. And I didn't want to go the route I did because of the interest rate, but I had all my ducks in a row and I was ready to go. So the property was there. I was purchasing the property, so it made sense. So I took the leap and it um, wasn't easy. You know, I ran out of money at the very end. I, the funniest part of On the Rocks is I opened December 16th in 2004. And two weeks later, I had to renew my liquor license and give the town of Lunenburg a check for $1,500. And I couldn't, I couldn't wait. You know, I, I had to open those two weeks. I had to give them $1,500 for two weeks to open just because I needed income. And, uh, but it worked, you know. So I guess they say the rest is history, right? Definitely is. So, well, I just want to say thank you very much. I know you're a busy guy. Obviously, you've got plenty going on. Um, thanks for coming down here and talking to me. I really appreciate it, and uh, can't wait to share your story and have some other people hear it. Yeah, thank you again, and uh, I really do. I, I appreciate that you thinking of me to do this, and I'm very honored, and I'm happy, and I hope we can help people that are looking to do something else. Thank you for tuning in with us. We do this to share the stories of some of the incredible individuals in your community. All we ask in return is if you found value from this episode, please share it with someone else who may also gain value from the show. Please feel free to rate or review the show. Your feedback helps us give you more of what you want. Until next time, I'm Tim Lanza, and this was another Local Legacy.